How many times did you get arrested? If I can count, well over 15 times. What are your charges? They range from drug charges, gang assault, menacing, stolen vehicles, attempt murder, anything that basically falls under gang relation. They say never judge a book by its cover. And this story is nothing short of those sentiments. Seeing where a person is, is good, but knowing where they came from, that's better, trapping it out. So when I was younger, I grew up around a lot of sexual abuse and I was exchanged for drugs as a child. Can we pause for a second? I gotta throw up. What's good? My name is Chris Styles. This is Trapping Anonymous. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you, everybody, for always liking, commenting, and sharing, and keeping this thing as viral as it's been. I'm just doing my best to get these stories to y'all. If you have a story that you think would be perfect for Trapping Anonymous, reach out at Chris Styles at Trapping Anonymous. We would love to hear your stories and just any information that we could get out to the people. Uh, please, if you need some merch, hit me up, DM me. I'm, I'm not that hard to reach. And just, uh, just do what you have to do as a community to help keep us at the forefront so that we could get our stories out the way we would have them told. Also remember that the stories that you hear do not necessarily reflect real life. They're here to entertain, educate, or just keep your little homie off the streets. My name is Chris Styles. It's only entertainment. Please don't get me indicted. Let's get it. How are you? I'm good. I jump right into all my interviews. This mm -hmm. one will be no different. Um, born addicted to cocaine. What does that look like as a baby? My father told me I came out um, shaking. He said he didn't understand why I was shaking and he had to ask the nurses what was going on. Hmm. And I'm assuming they had to wean you off of drugs. At that time, I guess what my dad said was I stayed in the hospital a few extra days but when I came home, I was fine. Hmm. Was your mother on drugs the entire pregnancy or from your knowledge? Or was that just like, she just like slipped up at, toward the end? From my knowledge, my dad says that she might have been using them, but she wasn't heavy in them to where it was noticeable to him because he had heard rumors about her doing drugs, but he never seen her high or actually doing drugs in his house. You told me a story about a close relative. Um, would you mind sharing that story? Which one? Um, it, the, the, the exchange for, for drugs. So when I was younger, I grew up around a lot of sexual abuse and I was exchanged for drugs as a child. What do you remember about that instance? I remember the person who was actually babysitting me at the time. Um, a man came in the house and I was in my room and I heard them talking. And then um, she came into my room and she brought me into the kitchen. Um, I had seen a man before and knowing that now as an adult looking back, he was a drug dealer. Um, and this person was a drug addict. So mm. I was told to um, go in a room with him and let him touch me. And they said that it wasn't going to hurt he wasn't going to hurt me. He just wanted to be nice to me is what they said. Um, at first, I didn't understand what was going on. I was, a, I was a kid, at least five or six years old. So at that time, I remember, I remember just being a little confused. Like, what do you mean be nice? 
But again, I've seen this man before, so I really didn't um, think he was going to hurt me initially. So I went in the room after a lot of prompting, a lot of um, coaching, I guess, because I wasn't willing to go in the room mm -hmm. right away at that time. Um, again, I'm, I didn't understand, like, what, what do you mean? How like, old were you? About five or six years old. So I went in the room and she shut the door and this man proceeded to molest me. What does that do to a child? What, 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 what are the effects from what you can remember of that to someone so young? What did it do to you? Well, if I could be honest, it became normal for me. Mm. It became normalized. It became something that I thought was okay. It became natural, to say the least. Um, I remember being a kid and moving forward and seeing grown men and sitting on their laps and nobody ever stopped me. And I remember rubbing on grown men's private parts and thinking that it was okay. And nobody ever stopped me from doing it. What age was this? Five, six. Up until? Up until about 10 years old. And you would say every man's lap that you sat on and rubbed his private parts, no one, none of them ever stopped you? Nobody ever stopped me. And they would touch you? And they would proceed to molest me. And this was normal? This was my norm. Wow. I thought it was what I was supposed to do. It had happened so many different times that that's just what I thought I was supposed to do. Does this, because being exposed to sex so young, taking away that innocence, does this spark hypersexuality within you? It does. Um, up until I was actually raped, I was very hypersexual. I remember having my first orgasm as a kid. Like, I had to be about seven, knowing what masturbation is and seeing porn, having a grown man show me porn for the first time and feeling aroused by it as a kid mm. and um, being molested to porn. Um, it made me very much so aware of my body in the wrong ways as a child up until I was actually penetrated. And that's when it was painful. Before then, it was like, you know, fondling and molestation as a means of arousal. Mm -hmm. But once I was actually penetrated, that's when my mindset changed because it hurt. Mm. In that situation, were you left alone? Was this a babysitter? Was this another drug transaction? What, what was that situation? This was a babysitter. He was an adoptive cousin of um, a relative. My mom left me with her best friend at the time for a series of two to three years. And um, she went on a drug run, is what we call it. A drug run is when she relapses and she disappears. She goes and does drugs for however long. Mm. Um, and then she'll resurface years down, down the line. So she left me with her best friend and um, her best friend's sister had adoptive children in her home, and this particular individual used to babysit us. Um, I woke up one day and he was in my bed. Okay. Take me back to that childhood. Take me back to you, you growing up. Your mother would go on these drug runs, but when she wasn't on the drug runs, was she a good mother? Was she kind? Was, did she do... Did she fulfill her duty as a mother? No. Um, she was always in active addiction when I was with her. I think even if she was clean at those times, it was never noticeable to me because I could never tell the difference because the interaction was never the same. 
Um, I used to be left in the house alone a lot as a kid. Usually there was no food in the house. Um, I remember eating mayonnaise for dinner when I was hungry, ketchup packets sometimes, mustard, condiments, basically. What? Um, to this day, I don't like um, crunch snacks, you know, like the... Star Crunch? I hate Star Crunch because sometimes that's all that was left in the house. So I, to this day, cannot. It makes me nauseous eating it. But... Um, Ketchup and mayonnaise, too? I just recently, as an adult, like two years ago, started eating, what? yeah, certain condiments. Ketchup never really bothered me, but, like, mustard, I hated mustard up until a couple years ago. How are you going to school? Someone has to be noticing something's wrong. This, like... What's, what's school life like? When the lunch comes, are you eating the school lunch? Are you taking advantage of that? I'm definitely taking advantage of it. Um, the lunch lady, she would give me extra food because she noticed that I would try to ask other students for their food. Mm. Sometimes school was the only meal that I had mm. unless I went home and it was condiments. I know on weekends and school breaks, I was always hungry. Is your, are your siblings around? Are they doing the same sorts of things, or is it just you? They were my youngest sister was a baby. I've never, rem I don't have any memories of them being in the house with me when they were toddlers. Always infant age, um, and I used to have to wake myself up in the morning and go to school. Sometimes my mom wasn't even home. I would literally wake up on my own. It was like an internal body clock. I would get up at the same time and go to school. What are your clothes like? Are you, are you? They're dirty. My mom had dogs at this time. I remember she had two dogs and they used to doo-doo all over the house, defecate all over the house. Pee, doo-doo. Sometimes my clothes had doo-doo stains on them from the dogs. Um, I would go to school with dirty clothes. I got picked on for it. Mm. Um, kids used to tell me I stink. Mm. Um, I just remember being an outcast, mm. being isolated, not having friends. And I knew then that it was solely because of the way that I looked and the way that I dressed. I was super small, um, didn't have clean clothes, so they didn't want to be my friend. Did that ever bother you? As a, as a child, it was just like, yo, I don't even give a fuck. Like, I got, I got bigger fish to fry. I mean, yeah, of course it would. You know, watching other children play with each other and I'm off to the side by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, they picked on me for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I used to take, um, I took a Rice Krispie treat out of the, the trash during snack time one day. And the teacher, everybody had snacks that their parents would bring them. I never had a snack. So... Little girl didn't finish her Rice Krispie treat. She threw it in the trash. I took it out the trash and ate it. They saw me eating it and made fun of me. Did this, then this didn't stop you? Did it, you just, you didn't give a fuck? No, no. When you're in survival, especially when you're hungry, mm. even as a child, I remember when I was eating ketchup packets, it was like, I have to put something on my stomach. I don't care. Someone calls ACS. They're, they're noticing this. They're noticing the stains on the clothes. They're noticing the, the hungriness. CPS comes. Um, oh, CPS, sorry. ACS, CPS. They come. The teacher called CPS, and CPS comes to the school first. I remember them asking me questions. I told them, my mom retells the story. She says, I told them that her and her boyfriend were arguing over butt crack. What? But it was, really crack. It was crack. So. You told that to the person that came? The CPS worker. Right. And my mother always coached me, do not talk to these people. Do not talk to anybody at school. But I talked to them anyway. Of course. So they went to the house, did a, a thorough analysis. And I remember different workers coming and having her to fix certain things. Like mm -hmm. we got rid of the dogs. So there was no more dog poop mm -hmm. around the house. Mm -hmm. um, she put food in the house. 
uh, and it was always just enough sometimes for them to come and close the case and not remove us from the home. But then there was two other times where they did remove us from the home and she had to come go through a program to get us back, me and my sister. So now you go to foster, mm -hmm. foster home. Yep. What was that like? Abusive, still, because again, at this time, I had these over-sexualized behaviors and mannerisms. So I'm going into my foster homes and I'm sitting on my foster father's lap, oh rubbing him, and now I'm being molested there too. Um, I bounced from different families. Never stayed in the family, I don't think, longer than a couple of weeks. It's like they never wanted me. They would just call my worker and the worker would come and say, well, this home's not gonna work for you and send me somewhere else. Your mother comes back. Mm -hmm. She finishes the program. When you come back to your mother's environment, is there change? Is there anything different? Or is it routine? And about what age are you at around this time? So the first time she got us back, I had to be about eight years old, eight or nine. And she was clean. But she was always clean for a short period of time because then everything else will go right back out the window. It will be back to now we don't have food again. Now she's leaving me in the house by myself again. Now, you know, I have my baby sister that I have to, I'm up changing her diapers because mm. my mother's not here and she's, you know, crying. I'm making bottles as a kid. I'm doing all of this stuff. Uh, my sister, actually, when we went to foster care the second time, they found out that my sister had a, a penny stuck in her throat as, a, as an infant child. She had a penny stuck in her throat and they had no idea how long it was there. Jesus Christ. Where's your father? You, you, you said you spoke to your father back then. You know, where, where is he? My father was in and out of jail himself for different things. And even in the times when he wasn't in jail, he would send me back to my mom because it, I was, quote unquote, a difficult child. Like anytime I acted up in school or anytime, you know, his girlfriend at the time didn't want to deal with me, he would send me with my mom. Mm. So I would go right back to my mom. And then there were times where he asked me, even as a kid, knowing that my mom has a drug, a drug issue, he would say, do you want to live with me or your mom? And of course, as a child who wants their mother, I always said my mom, so he would send me back to my mom. Wow. And this relationship never got better with you and him during this time period? During this time, no. How are your siblings managing? How are they growing up? How are, you know, what, what's the sort of the dynamic with them and like school and like home life and, and things like that? Are they On my father's side? The ones with your mom. Um, the relationship with them now, I don't have a relationship with them. We were separated. My siblings, my youngest sibling, my youngest sister was adopted. When we went to the foster care system, she ended up being adopted mm. and my father came and got me from foster care when he came home from jail. Mm. So she went on and became adopted. I just found her four years ago. Wow. Are you good in school? Growing up? Mm -hmm. No. I've gotten kicked out of every high school I ever attended. For what? Fighting, weapons, those are the two big, big ones. How many times did you get arrested? If I can count, well over, I would have to guesstimate 15 times. <coughs> Excuse me. What are your charges? What do they range from? They range from 
drug charges, gang assault, menacing, stolen vehicles, attempt murder, anything that basically falls under gang relation. The streets raised you. The streets raised me. When did that happen? When it was like, all right, I'm not getting the love at home. It's time to click up. It's time to get in the streets. What age did that happen? 13. And what is your fondest memory of the streets? The unity, the family, the love, the protection, the safety of knowing that if something happens to me, somebody has my back. Somebody's going to pay, finally, if they decide that they want to hurt me. Mm. I have people coming, coming for you for that. What was the worst part? It, it ruined my life, in a sense. Wow. How? I made a lot of bad choices. I did a lot of things that I regret out of anger, out of not knowing any better, out of just being lost in the world. I've hurt people before. I regret that. You hurt? Fighting. The last fight that I got into, I actually gave a woman a concussion and she ended up having slight brain damage from it. Were you like stomping on her head or like banging it on the ground and stuff like that? Pretty much. And what was this over? It wasn't even my fight. I was with a group of girls who were also gang affiliated at that time. They got into a fight. I was there. That means I have to fight too. You go to jail? I go to jail. How long? 19 months. Every time I talk to somebody about like their prison sentence, they always give it to me like in the months. Like, yeah, because get... that's, that's, that's that countdown. That's that timeline. And I didn't even go to prison. I stayed in the county. I was 16 years old. Oh, youthful offender. Youthful offender. What was the county like for that year and some change? Comfortable. What? Routine? Routine. Wow. I knew at some point in time, I think the hardest part was not knowing when I was going to get out because when I actually got arrested for that assault case, I went to court two months later and that's when they told me that I was having charges placed on me for the RICO. A RICO? They were, they were building a RICO case and they mentioned my name in the RICO case. So when I went to court for the assault charge, I had to fight that separate case as well. Is there leniency with the judge? Do, do, do you see compassion? None. He was sick of me. He knew you. Judge McKinney. <laughs> you smirk when you see. <laughs> Cause that, he was sick of me. Mm -hmm. I used to go to court and he used to look at, look me right in my face and say, didn't I tell you not to come back here? Mm. He knew me by first name basis. Wow. Um, so, so were you like fighting in jail too? Or did you sort of like calm down and be like, yo, let me just do my time and you know, get up out of here? When I first got there, um, I had an attitude. Mm -hmm. I had an attitude. People knew who I was. I was very popular. I had a name for myself. And when I went there, I had, it, I felt tough. Like, wow. yeah, y'all know who I am. Like, don't try me. So when I went at first, you know, was respected. Then you get older women. I was the youngest person on my pod. So then you got younger women like myself coming in. We, this, my first rodeo really. Mm -hmm. And then you got women that's been there for, however long they're going to challenge you. That's you get true. challenged. Right. So my first time being challenged was over a food tray. A lady came, snatched my food tray. We got into a fight. Okay. When you come home, do you kind of say like, all right, all these charges, I did some time. I think I'm gonna just chill out, try to get on a straight path, or do you go right back to the streets? At first, no. I went back to the street. Hmm. 
it was easy. Mm -hmm. It was I was accustomed to that, so that's all I knew. Street life. What was your most tra traumatizing uh, moment while in the streets? My ex got shot in front of me. Talk me, talk to me about that. I was fighting with some girls, and he was the type of person. He was like, "You, you fight, I fight." Nobody's going to jump her. Everybody knew if he was around and I got into a fight, if y'all jump me, he's hitting bitches. That's, that's what he used to say. I hit bitches. So you, you touch her, I'm going to hit you. Hmm. I end up getting, getting jumped and guy comes out, one of the girl's brothers comes out, shoots him right in front of me. He didn't even jump in? Nope. Close range in his chest. He's still, he's alive, but he still has a bullet in his chest right now. They can't even take it out. It's too close to his artery. Fight was over after that. Fight over. Fight over. Everybody dispersed. He's on the ground. Yeah. Who calls the police? Like I have no idea. I don't know who calls the police. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm, we're putting pressure on it, blood everywhere. Ambulance seems like they're taking forever. Ambulance gets there, they take them away. Was he like grimacing in pain or was he like conscious or? He's conscious, but he's, he's he keeps saying, I'm hit, mm -hmm. I'm hit. And he's like grabbing his chest mm -hmm. and then he passed out. He thought it was over. I thought he died. Yo. The, 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 these, these stories is just so cavalier to you. Like, you know, it's just, I know it's your life, but it's, you know, you, I don't know. These are like really intense, intense moments. Imagine living through it. I know. Okay, so you come back to the streets. And at what point do you say, all right, you know, like, let me just like try to straighten up and, you know, do something better. At this time, my dad um, was getting word. I had, a, I was living with my mom and my stepdad. I came home, she moved completely out of the hood. It's it, the house where I was living in New York. It was dead smack in the middle of the hood. Mm. So it was so easy at that time for me to continue to get into trouble. Yeah. But when I went home, she moved, she moved to the suburbs. I would find my way back to the city. She would threaten to call my PO on me. Mm. So I was telling my dad, you know, I'm gonna go back to jail because she keeps, she keeps calling my PO. My dad said, move to Albany with him. So that's what I did. I didn't really change until I moved to Albany and then I got pregnant. What was the worst part of jail for you? Watching everybody go home. I kept going to court. It became very discouraging. Every time I go to court, I think I'm going home. I'm not. Um, my lawyer is telling me that they're not offering a plea deal. They're not. Mm. Mm. doing nothing at first. They wanted me to sit in jail. And I wanted to go home. Were you, were you productive in jail? Were you in programs? Were you trying to go back to school? Were you, did you do any of those things? Because I was a minor under the, the New York state law, I had to complete school. Originally they were getting work from my then high school and allowed me to complete the work. I didn't want to do it, so I got my GED in jail. Hmm. Whatever happened in jail, you knew you didn't want to go back. Right. So your mother is threatening you, you're telling your dad, you get pregnant. Does that slow you down? No. It didn't, it didn't slow me down in the sense of stop my life. Hmm. It actually made me want to live. 
Yeah, so that's kind yeah. of like, yeah, like it, it slows you down from like the street life and doing all it those did. things. So like, all right, now I have something to live for, right. someone to live for. Right. What is the relationship like with the father? He was very abusive. Talk to me about that. Um, at first, you know, I was excited. I wanted a family. Things were looking very promising for the both of us. Very young, in love. And then things became toxic shortly after I had my son. Very physically abusive, very verbally abusive. Um, he stabbed me before. Um, just really bad fights, really bad, toxic, destructive fights. Like we would fight in the house and punch holes in the wall and break TVs and, and dishes and you name it, very destructive and toxic. In front of your kid? In front of my son. Is he old enough to actually process what's going on? No, he's a baby at this time. CPS now knocks on your door. CPS now knocks on my door. Cycle repeats itself tenfold. What they say to you? They tell me if I don't leave the home, they will petition in 24 hours to have my son removed from the home. What that do to you? It made me feel disappointed in myself because everything that I tried not to be as far as my mother's mistakes. Mm. Mm. I found myself in a position where I was repeating her history. So I left. 24 hours packed up? 24 hours. He went to work, came back. We were gone. Where do you go? I go anywhere from friends, cousins, sleeping on people's couches. Mm. I ended up staying with um, a family member for some time. That wore out. Went from Albany, New York to Syracuse, New York, where my mom was at the time. I thought she was clean. I get there, she has a eviction notice on her door. And then my sister reveals that she relapsed. I'm waiting for the silver lining, yo. Like I'm you know, forgive me, but I'm waiting for the, the moment things. Okay. You have a son. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Where do you go? Again, I'm back going back and forth between cousins' houses and sleeping on their couches and allowing my time there to be whatever it was they was going to allow me to be. Mm -hmm. um, Short-lived. You know, I got put out one day, staying with my cousin. The arrangement was for me to be an in-house babysitter for her, mm -hmm. but I couldn't get food stamps. I couldn't get anything without an address. So I had to get a job and try to figure things out and save money so I can get me and my son somewhere to live. One day I went to her house. My bags was outside. Mm. The dead smack of the winter. Mm. So, find myself homeless again. Where do you go? That particular night, my son and I slept on a park slide. In the middle of the winter? In the middle of the winter. How? I had a comforter that I stole from Macy's. And in that bag of a little bit of clothes that I had, I bundled him up in some extra clothes, wrapped ourselves in blanket, and slept on the slide. At that point, you realized you couldn't do this anymore? Couldn't do it. So I went to the women's shelter for the first time. Um, my pride finally mm. left me. Mm. Mm. Having my son out there felt worse than being too prideful and being embarrassed about being homeless and having my situation be what it was. What do you say to them at the shelter? Well, I get there, they tell me they have no room at first. So I tell the lady, I have absolutely nowhere to go. I have a child. 
I told her where I slept previous that night. Mm. She made a phone call and she made space for me. Here you are. Going through everything you're going through, you finally put your pride aside. You say, you know what, I'm gonna come to the shelter. You go to the shelter and they say, we ain't got no room. You refuse to hear no at that point. They made a way. You sleep in the shelter. What was that experience like? It's me on a bed with my son and four to five other women with their children in one room. For how long? Five months. In that situation? How did you make it out? I signed up for programs with them. I got a job, saved my money, and transitioned into my own living space. How old are you at this time? 21. What did that feel like at 21 to finally make it out, have a little money in your pocket and get into your own place? It felt like, I felt optimistic for the first time in a long time. I was able to stand on my own two feet. I felt like I had a better chance now to move forward and do something different with myself. That's a blessing. That is such a blessing. Um, you go back to school? I signed up for dental assisting school. What age is this? 22. And how was, how did you do in school? I did wonderful. I've always been smart. I think high school was just not the place for me because my gang activity. Yeah. But I was always smart, always liked school, always achieved better when I applied myself. Would you say your son saved your life? My son saved my life, yes. You do great in school. And um, where do you take things after that? I graduate dental assisting school. I start working. I start making decent money. I move out of the hood. Um, the place that I actually moved in motivated me even more to move to somewhere better, considering it was dead smack in the middle of the hood. My son didn't even have a place to play at the park because they would shoot. There were shootouts, broad daylight. Um, so I finally moved into a better space, got a car, moved out the hood. Life got better. Where do you take the dental uh, school? Was it a degree, certificate? It was a certificate, certification. And what do you, what do you, what do you take that to sort of like where you are now, the whole dental bay? How did that, how did that get birthed? and sort of talk to me about the success that you've had in that field, especially in Atlanta and um, moving there. Can we pause for a second? I gotta throw up. You got a bag? Don't. No bag, it's a brown, oh. When does Dental Bay come off and alive? Where, where, where did that come from? Dental Bay came from me developing my passion for dentistry. Mm -hmm. People started to gravitate towards me more mm -hmm. for dental advice um, and my infatuation with teeth. So, you know, I got into dental from nursing. I started off in a nursing background and immediately knew I didn't like it. Mm -hmm found dentistry and took off from there. My goal was to become a dental hygienist, and then become a dentist. You graduated top of your class. Cum laude. Wow. Was that like a satisfying moment for you? Like knowing like, I always had it in me. I just had to redirect my energy, redirect my gift, my talents, my, my education, my life. You know, was that like a gratifying moment for you? It was one of the best feelings in the world mm. for me, mm. especially considering 
I didn't have many people who thought I would be anything other than my mugshot. Wow. The problem child, the black sheep, who turned into the goat. The goat, indeed. Um, the mugshot. It sort of took you to the next level, right? Here we have it. It's the dichotomy of one part of your life being sort of the worst place in, you could possibly be in, and it also propelling you to this viral moment where you have all of these followers now, everybody's tuned in, they want to know what's going on in your life, where you come from, what's going on. What was that like? Being able to use something so negative and now something so positive, and the day you went viral and all of that. Like, well, originally that mugshot was used against me. Mm. Someone tried to blackmail me with the mugshot. I was up for a promotion and there was somebody else who was interested in the position. She decided that she wanted to Google me, find my mugshot mm. and try to blackmail me with it. Mm. Um, at that time, it was something that I was trying to hide about myself. The person that I had created and grew into was not that mugshot anymore. So at first it was embarrassing. Mm. It was like, wow, I tried to bury my past and here it is. But I decided to say, fuck it. I'm gonna just post it. I'd rather tell my story than somebody to try to use it for a negative light because I'm not that girl in the mugshot anymore. Post it, close your eyes, turn off your phone. I struggled for two days before I posted it because it that's the first time it conflicted with everything that I had grew into. Um, the clean cut girl, the prim and proper girl, the, the well-spoken, beautiful, articulated woman that I've become. That mugshot didn't look like that. Mm. So I said, fuck it. You know, I'm that person and I'm this person. Mm. I don't look like what I've been through and I'm not going to let my past dictate the limitations on how far I can go in life. It goes viral? It goes viral. I posted it, struggled for two days, posted it, logged out, went to sleep, woke up, viral post. Wow, you, 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 can't, you can't plan those moments, right? Like if you would have been like, I'm gonna use this to propel my career and do this and that, it would never work. But it was organic, it was, it, was, it was a real emotion, it was a real life, you know. And you know, screw those people that try to like use your past and like mm -hmm. try to use things that, you know, you grew from and healed from to, to try to bring you down. You know, what the enemy means for evil, God will make for good. I'm firm right. believer in that. You know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't stop me. You can't stop me, if anything, that was a catalyst to you becoming the entity that you are today. Right. I love that. Um, what's next for you? What, what, what do you want to, what do you want to take it? Dental Bay or are you Miss Janika Banks now? Well, I, I'm both. Yeah. I'm very much so Dental Bay and Miss Janika Banks. They go one, one and the same. I don't have to completely disown who I am or who I used to be because it made me who I am today. Um, so what's next for me is wherever God takes me from here. I do motivational speaking now, internationally and nationally. I tell my testimony I'm on platforms to, you know, be an inspiration to other people and let them know that you can come from some dark places and still go to the brightest places in the world. You can still have a bright future. No matter what the circumstances were, you can grow from who you used to be. So I have that. I also mentor the youth. I do jail ministry now. I go back and forth to jails and I talk to um, women and men mm. um, in hopes of inspiring them to do better when they come home from jail. Let them know like you made mistakes, but you can move forward Straight and up. learn from them. Um, I also have an etiquette academy and a book coming out that I'm launching 
January 1st, wow. 2024. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Like, I'm like, proud of you. Thank you. Um, what's something you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self that no matter what you're going through, you're going to be okay. You're going to make it out. And that you're stronger than you think. Strap Anonymous, my name is Chris Dabbs. Let's get it. Let's get it.